George, did you know that pink kryptonite makes Superman gay? Gay like happy or, you know, gay gay? Gay gay. It was an issue of Supergirl back in the 90s and was meant to be a one-shot joke, but some people have not let it go. How did they show he was gay? It was a comic book in the 90s. What do you think? Stereotypical. He really loved Jimmy Olsen's outfits and he used the word fabulous, which codes for gay man for some reason. Why would kryptonite make anybody gay? This sounds like Alex Jones and Hormones in the Water turning the frogs gay. Oh, it's stupid, but this movie has Patrick Stewart in it, and as I watched Jeffrey, I kept thinking that Captain Picard got a hold of the pink kryptonite. You know who would really go crazy with pink kryptonite? Captain Kirk. Oh my god, he already fucked every woman in the universe, gave him pink kryptonite, and nobody is safe. I could see him sucking off Spock, but it's Spock's ear. Suck my ear, bitch! That sounds awfully aggressive for Mr. Spock. You know Wesley would be a twink. I thought Wesley was a twink. If they had pink kryptonite in the Marvel Universe, we could finally see Cyclops and Wolverine do the nasty. Wolverine has got to be a power bottom. Welcome to Does This Still Work? The podcast that looks at always and asks, does so this still work? I'm Joe Dixon. And I'm George Romacca. Today we're discussing Jeffrey from 1995 and some historical context. First, podcasty stuff. You can reach us at dtswpod at gmail.com on Facebook, Letterboxd, and Counter Social. Please tell your friends about us and leave five-star ratings everywhere. You can pick what we watch and get extra per-episode content by funding us on Patreon for as little as a dollar a month at patreon.com slash dtswpod. Now, Joe, take us back to 1995. What was happening with the gays in 1995? I'll answer my question by saying, kind of a mixed bag, actually. So this movie takes place in New York. All my newspaper sources will be from the city I live in. Not George. George has no interest in living in New York City. True. It's remarkably expensive to live in New York City. And yet I managed to do it. This is from the New York Daily News. Headline, George. Gay clearance ban axed. That's right, kids. Back in the day, the United States... Not just the United States, but in governments across the world during the Cold War thought the gays could not be trusted with classified information because they could be blackmailed since being a homosexual was a crime. Of course, they could have fixed that by simple decriminalization of queer lives, but God forbid. Mm -hmm. So gays were banned. For some reason, nobody seemed to believe straight men having affairs would also be the subject of blackmail. Somehow that never came up. Your average soap opera knew a man can be blackmailed for straight sex, but not our government. Although in the US government, you can be court-martialed for adultery, but how often were they doing that? Not terribly. Back to the article. In 1995, President Clinton issued an order preventing the federal government from banning gay people from access to classified intel. This order also allowed anyone who had been banned in the past to appeal that decision. This article also mentions how disgraced CIA agent Eldridge Ames went around living in a lavish lifestyle far beyond what a government salary could afford while these rules were in effect, thanks to all the cash Moscow was giving him. This new process would now have your finances scrutinized more than your sex life. Any thoughts, George? Good move. But I am correct about that. I mean, even now, you could technically be tried for adultery in the military, right? Yeah. What does the military care? I'm sorry, just no one's ever challenged that. Because most of the people that you'd be cheating with would be the spouses of other service members, and that is prejudicial to good order and discipline within a unit. Ah. If you're fucking your buddy's wife, you can't trust that your buddy's going to have your back in a combat zone. I see. Mm, Okay. Now, you would think, good for President Clinton. Good he did that, and it is good. But sadly, that's not where he stopped. This is also from the Daily News. Same year. Headline, George. Navy honors gay it wants to oust. Quote, the Navy yesterday gave a medal to gay officer on the first anniversary of the Pentagon's don't ask, don't tell policy. The irony is that Lieutenant Tracy Thorne, 28, is on reserve duty while awaiting final word on the Navy's move to discharge her for being openly gay. I'm still befuddled by it all, Thorne told reporters. My commanding officer said, on the one hand, we're trying to kick you out. On the other hand, we're giving you a medal. End quote. The Clinton administration had a policy of allowing you to be gay, but, you know, Don't tell anybody, which only sounds odd to our modern ears because it was. Though it really does sum up the 90s and gay life. For example, sitcoms would have sympathetic depictions of gay characters, but a male series regular had to have at least one gay panic episode where he's terrified of being gay, or people will think he's gay, or he got drunk and he may have had gay sex. 
The subjects being LGBTQ folks are cool, but you wouldn't want to be one because that's gross. Uh, George, do you remember that? How sitcoms would do that? Yeah, that was Friends. <laughs> that was the entire premise of Friends. It wasn't just Friends on Seinfeld, George Costanza, not you, George. Thank you. George Costanza and uh, Jerry Seinfeld were afraid. People thought they were gay on an episode of the John Larroquette show. He gets drunk one time and some guy says, you and I had sex. And he said, oh my God, am I gay? Blah, blah, blah. And, and it turns out, of course, they didn't have sex. But I, it, just, it was a plot that there came There was an over. episode of The Office where Michael started a rumor that Andy was gay and Andy was panicking because he thought he might be. Yes, that's right. Yeah. So it's like a, just reoccurring. It's really strange. Mm -hmm. Or maybe not. Maybe not so strange. Uh, no, no, it makes perfect sense in the context of, you know, history, but it doesn't make sense in context of reality. Right. This article points out that at the time, the first year of Don't Ask, Don't Tell, 188 gay service members were either forced out or an attempt was made to force them out. Disgraceful. Mm -hmm. However, I don't want this to be a downer. The dude we mentioned, Tracy Thorne, came out all right. I mean that in every sense of the word. This is from Wikipedia. Quote, In 1994, President Clinton instituted Don't Ask, Don't Tell, a policy which barred open homosexuals from military service but forbade officers to investigate the sexuality of service members. Thorne's previous assertion became a test of this new policy, and proceedings against him continued. While Thorne's discharge proceedings were underway, he was awarded the Navy Achievement Medal for superb leadership, exceptional professionalism, and total devotion to duty. In 1994, a Navy Board of Inquiry recommended that Thorne be honorably discharged, though the discharge was not official until May 6, 1995. Thorne then brought suit in federal court to overturn the discharge. The court ordered his reinstatement while the case proceeded. After he lost his challenge to DADT in both the U.S. District Court and the Fourth Circuit Court of Appeals, the Supreme Court declined to hear his appeal on October 19, 1998, and he was again discharged. Thorne's various cases left him with a new interest in the law. He pursued a degree at the University of Richmond School of Law, graduating in 1997. End quote. As of this writing, Tracy Thorne is now Judge Thorne, or rather, Judge Thorne Beglin, as he is married, married to a man. He is a jurist on the General District Court of Richmond, Virginia. Good for him. Yep. Moving on, let's get into some more gay panic from the 90s. This is from the Daily News again. Headline, George. TV Fatal Attraction. Jenny Jones Guest Kills Admirer. Jenny Jones was a daytime talk show host who once did a show where a person was introduced to their secret crush. During one segment, an absolute POS met a gay man who had a crush on him. That gay man was named Scott Emma Jury. During the filming of the show, everything seemed cool. The piece of shit wasn't interested and seemingly laughed it off. Three days later, Scott left a construction light at this guy's dock with a note saying, you have the right tools to turn this on. A normal person would have laughed this off, but the asshole read the note and because this is America, went and bought a shotgun. He then went to Emma Jury's home and asked him if he had written this note. Scott said yes. This garbage human got it confirmed that a gay man was interested in him and wrote him a note. He took that information with him to his car, got a shotgun, went back to Emma Jura's place, and shot him twice. Obviously, there's a straight-up first-degree murder. The thing is, since the victim was queer and the killer was a straight, this meant the straight man got to use the gay panic defense. If you don't know, the gay panic defense is where a straight person can claim that the mere action of a gay person making a pass at them was enough for them to go temporarily insane and murder the person. Thanks to that homophobic bullshit, this monster got charged with second-degree murder, was sentenced to 25 to 50 years, and got out in 2017. A complete travesty of justice. And finally, 1995 saw a breakthrough on AIDS drugs. Headline, George. New AIDS remedies readied. By the mid-90s, AIDS was no longer an automatic death sentence. A number of drugs made it to market, allowing millions of people to live a relatively normal life. I have enough problems pronouncing the names of human beings, I'm not going to try and name the drugs in this article. Suffice it to say, they helped build the foundations to numerous HIV medications we have today. I watch MSNBC, and they have tons of ads for antivirals, right in the mix for drugs to fight cholesterol or high blood pressure. That's progress. Mm-hmm. Okay, George, tell us about Jeffrey. And do you know if this is a gay movie with mostly straight actors in the gay roles? Steven Weber, the Jeffrey of the movie, is definitely not gay. Neither is Patrick Stewart. Even Michael T. Weiss 
the love interest appears to be married to a woman. The guy who plays Stuart's boyfriend is gay, though. Well, I was going to save that for the conclusions, but yeah, that's accurate. The only Darius's actor is verifiably gay today with as many years between this movie and now. You know, the evidence would have come out, presumably. And, yeah, no, this is mostly straight men playing gay people. So that's something to keep in mind when we discuss our conclusion. Mm -hmm. This was directed by Christopher Ashley. The screenplay and the play that this is based on were written by Paul Rudnick. I don't know if Christopher Ashley is ever going to give you up or let you down or run away or hurt you. That's Rick Astley. Oh, I also don't know any other movies he's directed. Uh, for Paul Rudnick, I have seen his work in in and out and Adam's Family Values. I will say this for Mr. Rudnick, he's funny. Okay. All those movies are funny. In and Out was funny. And Family Values was funny. And this movie was funny. Doesn't mean it was good, but it was tough, I definitely liked the part. Mm -hmm. Blurbs. IMDb says, A poignant romantic comedy about the quest for love and intimacy in the age of AIDS. A story of a 30-ish gay actor slash waiter who decides to become celibate, the risk of AIDS has taken all the joy from sex. Mm. It's definitely a romantic comedy. I would quibble on how poignant it was, quite frankly, but I guess we'll talk about that. I'm not even sure I could define poignant, Joe. <laughs> Amazon says, Disenchanted with the not-so-romantic side of safe sex, sweet, single, and obsessive Jeffrey vows to become completely celibate. No sooner has he sworn off sex than he meets hunky, sensitive Steve. But just as passion starts to ignite, Steve reveals some earth-shattering information, leaving Jeffrey to choose between losing the man of his dreams or taking a risk on what just might be true love. Shut the fuck up, Amazon. Jesus Christ. That was too much. <laughs> And I like how they had uh, Jeffrey vows to become completely celibate and with an exclamation point at the end. Yeah, I th that might have been the longest blurb we've ever seen. That yeah, was long. So it's 1995. I am a freshman in high school who hasn't met his first wife yet. Our protagonist, Jeffrey... Oh, I'm sorry. Oh, I, I know. We're just getting started here. But so uh, what age were you when you the two of you met? I was a sophomore in high school. Ah, okay. And she was as well? No, she was a year behind me. That's why I hadn't met her yet when I was a freshman. Ah. Our protagonist, Jeffrey, tells us how he really feels about sex. It would be a sound clip, but between the lively jazz music and fireworks, it wouldn't make a good one, so I'll just quote him. I love sex. It's just one of the truly great ideas. I mean, just the fact that our bodies have this built-in capacity for joy, oh, it makes me love God. Yes! <laughs> how does God get in there? The film will get into who and what he thinks God is later. Suffice it to say that the prevailing view on how God would see him is that he's gay, unmarried, and any sex he has is grounds to stone him to death. <laughs> I'm not sure why the evolutionarily obvious purpose of sex, and particularly of orgasm, makes him love a conceptual bogeyman that condemns it in most of its incarnations, but hey, I don't write movies. <laughs> Did you know that uh, orgasm and uh, ejaculate are not the same thing? No, they just happen to happen usually around the same time. Yes. Oh, okay. You do know that. I just found that out. Yeah, because sometimes I do the ejaculate part without the orgasm part, and that's not as much fun. No. Yes, I found that out myself. <laughs> that's how I, I looked that up, and I go, like, hey, that wasn't enjoyable. <laughs> What? That doesn't make sense. That's not how this usually ends. No. At least usually feel good about the mess I just made. <laughs> Jeffrey is played by Steven Weber. I mostly know Steven Weber from the sitcom Wings. I've also seen him on Curb Your Enthusiasm, Studio 60 on the Sunset Strip, and for movies I've previously seen him in, that would be Sour Grapes. Then we get a montage of various sexual escapades, all within a context of a world in which AIDS is killing his friends. There's a broken condom, someone just wanting to cuddle, and a consent getting via medical history that turns out to be an apartment application. Jeffrey deals with this existential anxiety by declaring that he's going completely celibate. That's right, no more fucking, kissing, or intimate touching of any kind. Now, this isn't all about his own life. He's not going no fuck forever only because he doesn't want to risk catching HIV, and we'll get to that in a few. First, we have to see him immediately regret his decision. At the gym, because of course. There he meets Steve Howard, a gorgeous bartender who spots his chest presses before aggressively making Jeffrey regret his recent decision to deny himself dick or anything attached to one. 
Steve is played by Michael T. Weiss. None of this guy's credits I know, which doesn't seem possible. I could have sworn I've seen him in other stuff. I haven't seen him in anything. Kit sure did, and refused to call him anything but Jared, his role in mid-90s TV show The Pretender, as she gushed over him. Uh. By the way, it wasn't it, it kind of weird that, I mean, I, I guess the film didn't want to get too graphic in it, but his giving of sex doesn't mean he has to be celibate. Yeah, and that's brought up to him, and it he just deflects it. it yeah, it's just sort of brushed over. It doesn't quite make any sense. Steve's advances collide with his recent abstinence choice and cause so much cognitive dissonance that he runs from the gym and clumsily avoids getting creamed by a taxi. He's helped to his feet by none other than Mother Teresa herself. Mother Teresa was a monster! Thank you, Kit. <laughs> Mother Teresa is played by Irma St. Paul. I saw 12 Monkeys. Uh, Ms. Irma was in 12 Monkeys, so I guess I saw her in that. You saw Mother Teresa. I swear, she helped me up. Well, how did she look? Well, I don't know. She was walking. She looked great. Oh, please. She's at work done. That's Sterling, ostensibly Jeffrey's best friend, as he's trying on a coat in a store and casually slapping away the hand of a salesman. Sterling is an interior decorator and is played by Sir Patrick Stewart. Do I even have to say Star Trek Next Generation? He's back on TV as Picard, actually. And on top of that, he just played Charles Xavier in the last Doctor Strange movie. He also played Professor X in Logan. And of course, for this podcast, we saw him in X-Men for episode 49. As if to underscore the things Joe has seen him in, he wraps a red sweater around his neck and says this as his next line. Can I do this? Or do I look like some sort of gay superhero? Jeffrey tells Sterling about his dedication to dick avoidance. Sterling thinks he just needs to find a stable monogamous relationship, citing his own with his partner Darius as an example of gay relational bliss. They go to get a bite to eat, and Sterling casually works in that Darius' recent issues preventing him from fulfilling his role as a dancer in Cats were simply a side effect of his AZT. For those who don't know, HIV, or human immunodeficiency virus, was first clinically described in the U.S. in 1981, where it had been retroactively identified in humans as far back as 1966. Ronald Reagan was president at the time. He and his wife were instrumental in delaying availability of any treatment until 1987, when zidovudine, a.k.a. AZT, became available. AZT, on its own, was not terribly effective, but since it was the only game in town, that's what anyone with HIV and access to medication took twice a day. Stating that Darius was having a reaction to AZT is the movie casually telling us that Sterling's partner has HIV. This is the other side of Jeffrey's no-coitus coin. He doesn't only want to not risk catching HIV himself. He is also living in a time when HIV is guaranteed to become AIDS and when AIDS is guaranteed to be terminal. He doesn't want to be in a relationship and risk the emotional trauma of watching a partner die. I, mean, I presume this is written closer to the 90s, because by 95, I mean, obviously it's never a good time to have AIDS, but it was, you, people were not, uh, like, like I said in the history, it wasn't a death sentence by no, 95. No, but for it to have been a play and then became a movie... That means that it was written before 1995. Right. And the play was not entirely fictional. It was based on the, I think, the writer or somebody that he knew. I can't remember now. Oh, I'm, I'm sure it wasn't. I mean, a lot of people are terrified to have sex. And I, 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 who can blame them? Yeah. Jeffrey has a daydream of sorts where he's on a game show called It's Just Sex, which serves as a platform to interrogate that concept, ultimately determining that he is full of shit, that sex isn't just sex. Now let's get to know Jeffrey a bit, since all we know so far is that he's gay and a mess of celibacy. Okay, so I'm an unemployed actor. And I'm talented. I think I am. Last week I read for a part on a TV show. We see him audition for a part as a cop who's supposed to be breaking down a door and arresting a ghetto drug lord. He'll get a part, not the cop, but the cat-cuddling neighbor who exasperatedly tells the cop to shoot the dealer. Between roles, he's a catering waiter. For the event of the evening, a fundraiser for a bunch of causes ranging from HIV to breast cancer, he is wearing his waiter tux with a small Native American headdress. E. <laughs> Other staff are wearing cowboy hats. I understand that's a joke, but I, I just did not see what the point was. Mm -hmm. The event is being hosted by a number of cameos. Earlier, I mentioned Jeffrey and Sterling Eating. The maitre d' was K. Todd Freeman. Skip Winkley, the host of Jeffrey's in-head game show, was Robert Klein. The casting director for the cop show was Peter Bartlett. And the hostess of the evening's hoedown for AIDS 
is Christine Baranski, who we know is the mom from episode 25, The Birdcage. Oh, that's right. The bartender for the event is none other than Steven, and we get Steve's fantasy of a big gay dance number to set Jeffrey's anxieties flaring again. Now, that's another problem with this uh, movie, is that too many people get to talk to the camera. <laughs> It really should be a one or maybe two person thing, but everybody gets a shot that, I mean, Grant, he doesn't really talk to the camera, but he, he takes over the narrative for a second and has this fantasy and I'm like, Ugh. and Darius, he gets to talk to the camera. I'm like, he's just a minor character. Why is he chatting to the camera? I wouldn't say he's a minor character. I think there are four, there's one main character and three main supporting characters and Darius. Right, well, he's that's a supporting character. Jeffrey's next attempt to deal with the plot is to join a 12 step program for sexual compulsives. Despite the heaviness of the plot, but this is a comedy, so each person giving their testimony is a joke, not advancing the plot, so that's the last I'll say about them. Did you remember when I told my story about when I went to a sexual compulsives group, 12-step program? I hoping I would meet a woman, and it was just dudes there. I don't remember this. I never told I told you that I told it on this on the show. I'm sure you did. I don't remember it. <laughs> Because you don't listen to me. Don't listen to my wonderful stories. All right, that's fine. Jeffrey attends a dinner party at Sterling's, and we finally meet Darius, played by Brian Bat. I saw 12 Years a Slay, and he was in that. And funnily enough, he was a dancer in Cats on Broadway. Ah. So him being that as this character is sort of an inside joke. <laughs> Sterling, this time with Darius' help, again makes the case to Jeffrey that he needs to find someone to settle down with. This prompts Jeffrey to ask why gay people need to emulate straight people in their behaviors, mannerisms, and relationships. Good question, Jeffrey. <laughs> and they proceed to do exactly that anyway. Mm -hmm. Sterling has also arranged for Stephen to show up, prompting another sprint out the door from Jeffrey. This time, he is followed by Sterling, Darius, Stephen, and more cameo randos from the street, who all pressure him into eventually saying yes to a date with Steven. Jeffrey. Yes? I just, um, just so there's no surprises. Sure. I'm HIV positive. Jeffrey pretends that this isn't his absolute worst fear and the entire reason he'd sworn off sex and goes to attend a service by Deborah Morehouse, title carded as the nation's hottest postmodern evangelist, a Tony Robbins-esque motivational speaker played by Sigourney Weaver. We last saw her in Alien, episode 134. And I have people coming to me and saying, Deborah, I'm in love with an alcoholic. What should I do? And I say, don't look to me for answers. Look to yourself. Of unconditional love. Find that all encompassing ultimate love. Surrender to that unending infinite love that will let you say, hey, fuck you! Get out of my house till you stop drinking! That sounds great and empowering. <laughs> she calls an acolyte up. That's what her followers are called, acolytes. That doesn't sound like a fucking cult. <laughs> she calls one up on stage with her and pulls some satanic panic shit, convincing her that her mother abused her and counseling her to beat her mother to death with a bat. <laughs> that acolyte is played by Kathy Najami. And we lost saw her in Fisher King, episode 149. Mm -hmm. In response to Jeffrey's very specific problem that he's falling for someone HIV positive, she goes into some the secret shit about people getting sick because they don't love enough. <laughs> that is... 100%. I want to say this is a thing that went on in the 90s. Fuck that. That goes on now. People still yep. believe stuff like that. Nowadays, we have a term for it. It's called toxic positivity. Oh, I never heard that term, actually. Yep. It's positivity that's so toxic that it becomes victim blaming. Oh, it was 100% victim blame. No question about that. Oh, are you sick? Are you cancer? Do you love enough? Have you been working enough? Have you been pinning your heart out there enough? Like, I can't. <laughs> this cancer isn't my fault. And I, I mean, it really is uh, just gross. Well, I mean, you do chain smoke 13 packs of cigarettes a day. I meant me in the broad sense. I didn't literally me. I mean, yes, I do smoke 16 packs. No, no, I don't, <laughs> I don't even want you to yes and that. That's, you do not smoke 13, you don't smoke one, you don't smoke any cigarettes any day, and I actually love that about you. <laughs> You're the former smoker. I am the former smoker. He stands Steven up for their date, leaving a lie about working late on his answering machine. 
Michael T. Weiss does a fantastic job acting here as his character tries to desperately dance and push himself through a bout of crushing disappointment and loneliness. True. But he's also a bartender in a very nice looking apartment, especially the front of the building. Like, oh, that place must be pretty priced. It looks like they're in the village. Mm -hmm. Jeffrey reiterates the central question of the film. What am I so afraid of? Him getting sick? Me getting sick? Why is the idea of a simple dinner now like an evening of Russian roulette? Then, unable to even be alone with himself, Jeffrey goes for a walk. He runs into Sterling and Darius, patrolling to prevent gay bashing as members of the culturally appropriative Pink Panthers. <laughs> They're eventually drawn away by a call that Todd, a huge bodybuilder from the gym, is in Washington Square, in shorts, but not before telling Jeffrey to call Steve again. These people, uh, I mean, obviously, this it's Jeffrey's movie and this is meant as a, something of a joke, but these people are way too invested in this man's life. <laughs> yeah, certainly these characters have their own lives, clearly, even drawn in this film. Unlike the other people walking in the street who care about who Jeffrey is dating, <laughs> these guys at least have something else to do. And it's still like, oh, please call this man. Like, he'll call him and not call him. Why are you, you're, you're, you're way over involved in this person's uh, love life, folks. Okay. Oh, you don't think so? No. Uh, I, I think I, that if your friends run into you they're, and they knew that you had a date, they're going to ask how your date was. That would be fine, except that isn't where this started. I mean, this has been going on for a while, and it's been like, oh, Jeffrey, you got to go with them. Oh, Jeffrey, you got to do this. Jeffrey, you got to do this. Like, I, 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 just calm I mean, down it's a the bit. movie. Like, it, I don't know what you expect. Like, how real you want this farcical <laughs> movie to be. <laughs> I'm just saying. Jeffrey goes and gets something to eat, sitting outside the cafe, and Stephen, also out for a walk, sees him. Steve isn't buying the lie about having to work late, and Jeffrey chases after him to apologize, which, to Stephen, is another slap in the face because he knows what the risks are and doesn't deserve being lied to. Jeffrey chases him all the way home. They talk and are about to kiss, and then Jeffrey balks, which is too much for Stephen, who just goes into his apartment. Well, it looks like in a very nice neighborhood. <laughs> <laughs> well, this is a, it's a Greenwich Village, as I said. Jeffrey starts walking home and is soon assaulted by three thugs. And this part of the movie could have gotten way, way darker. He's a little bloodied, but otherwise okay. Mother Teresa... Mother Teresa was a monster! <laughs> ...comes to hold and comfort him while he sings show tunes with someone in the window of a nearby apartment. Next, he calls his parents. Dad is played by Peter Maloney. Of his movies, I've only seen Amityville Horror and JFK. And Mom is played by Deborah Monk. I've seen her in The Savages, Bullworth, In-N-Out, and Quiz Show. I'm not going to describe this scene. This scene is a reason to watch this movie, whatever we end up saying about it. I watched it for free on a legit streaming service, so yeah, go do that and enjoy. Go see this scene for yourself. <laughs> Fucking fantastic. <laughs> This is your favorite scene? It doesn't advance the plot at all, but it is funny. <laughs> so just go enjoy that. Next, we get Jeffrey's turn to testify at Sexual Compulsives Anonymous, which isn't really anonymous because they stand up there and say their names, but whatever. <laughs> That's right. I didn't even think of that. <laughs> well, they don't say that last name, so it's safe. He describes his formative sexual experience in front of the big mirror in his parents' bedroom as a 14-year-old boy with another 14-year-old boy who kept daring him to do things. Mm. And at the end of it, he leaves it kind of ambiguous as to whether or not this should have been considered a sexual assault. Oh my God, no, I didn't take that at all. By the way, I don't, I don't know if um, Paul Rudnick knew uh, Ellen DeGeneres at the time, but I, I mean, I, don't, I remember how old DeGeneres was. When she told the story about her first experience with a girl, she talked about how it happened in front of a mirror. So I don't, I don't know if he knew that story, or, or maybe it's just a common story for gay people. I, I don't know. Or maybe a lot of people, I wasn't having sex at 14, so maybe they were all doing it in front of mirrors. <laughs> I know I wasn't. Then he's waitstaff at a memorial for a deceased curator of the Metropolitan Museum of Art. The memorial is title carded as a bachelor party, and the theme of the scene is the sheer quantity of available man-ass gathered in one place. Hmm. And this is sometime in the future, because that guy Todd from earlier, whose beshorted ass was enough to draw the Pink Panthers across town, is now an emaciated blind AIDS victim. And this freaks Jeffrey right the fuck out. Hmm. Jeffrey accompanies Sterling and Darius to the ballet. After, as they are descending a spiral staircase, Darius gets dizzy. He says he's fine, then falls down the stairs, busting his head open. Jeffrey says out loud that this is because Darius is taking itraconazole, which is a broad-spectrum antifungal medication. 
Now, when I was watching the movie, I thought he was saying the full name of AZT as a way to maybe get help from somebody who knows about it, because what happens next is a lady with a kid says that her cousin is on that, the antifungal, and gives Jeffrey a hanky and says, put this on his head wound. I have no idea what to think of it since it wasn't the name of AZT, which, as I said earlier, is Zidovudin. Fuck, I don't know. Darius gets up, says he's fine again, then falls back down the stairs. Yep, that happens. Jeffrey goes to a Catholic church to ask the problem of evil. There, he's met by Father Dan, who is played by and is basically Nathan Lane. His form was the most fun I had in this film. Uh, this whole movie is a sitcom, but his appearance was the most over the top of anyone. He's also one of the few actual gay people in this movie. And speaking of gay, we last saw him in The Birdcage, episode 25. And in all honesty, this is another scene that you should just watch the movie for, because I can't do it justice with an explanation. I'll just say that Jeffrey doesn't get any answers that he actually wants, because this movie isn't enough to provide any answer to the problem of evil that isn't because God isn't real. <laughs> I do have to mention church lady number one, one of two ladies in the pews who are delighted by Father Dan's antics. She is played by Mary Bond Davis. She was a Coming to America, which we saw for episode 17. And now it's time for a pride parade. Stephen is organizing marchers. The first unit will be as follows. Dykes on bikes. Concerned Pan-Asian bisexuals. Black gay Republicans. Aside from a couple cameos, that joke is the black representation in the film. <laughs> It's also accurate. Yeah. <laughs> there are more of those now. Yeah, probably. Like, they're, they're act, they actually show up places. Hmm. Among the marchers is Olympia Dukakis, being an almost perfectly supportive parent of what I'm going to call a trans person that the movie calls her pre-operative transsexual lesbian son, Angelique, played by Gregory Jbarra. Jeffrey shows up, but isn't marching. He just happened to be jogging through Central Park on Pride Day. <laughs> Asshole. <laughs> and not even realizing, even though he sees all these people in the park, making no secret of what they're there for, he just completely misses it. Sterling and Darius show up to march with interior designers fight AIDS. And also, true story, Brian Bat, the actor playing Darius, is an interior designer now. Oh, really? I, I saw his listings on IMDb. I thought he was still uh, but he was a producer these days. He might be, because they don't list interior designer on IMDb. Oh, so how'd you find that out? Wikipedia, the other ah. source of information, <laughs> the secondary primary source of information for this podcast. True. The takeaway from this scene for the plot is that Steven has a boyfriend, and that doesn't matter to Jeffrey because he's moving back to Wisconsin, too, and I'm not putting words in anyone's mouth. Hide until AIDS or his life is over, whichever comes first. Uh. A few days after the parade, Darius dies. Sterling doesn't want Jeffrey's help or comfort, seeing his imminent move to Wisconsin as a sort of betrayal and an indication that his friend isn't really there anymore anyway. To be clear, and Sterling even admits this himself, Sterling is out of his fucking mind with grief. So much so that the actor, Sir Patrick Stewart, thought about this movie when he was playing Jean-Luc Picard, who'd found out that his entire family back home was dead, so that he could start crying and add emotion to that role. Hmm. Going back a little bit, when he's going to Wisconsin and uh, he's got to get away from all this, I could be wrong about this, but I think AIDS was also in Wisconsin. And there are also gay people there, so I'm not... I don't know how you really escape these things. I think his parents were in Wisconsin. Yes, I know. I understand that. He's going back to his family, but I'm just, but he's also like escaping age. I'm like, well, that's not going to happen. <laughs> and also like small town gay, not the same as New York City gay. Like the visibility, the quantity, the quality. I'm not going to say that. <laughs> But no, they have major. I mean, we don't know where in Wisconsin. We don't know if he's moving to a small town in Wisconsin. Maybe a big. There is no place in Wisconsin that's like New York City. Oh well, I, well, I don't mean that. But I'm. But they do have cities. Yeah, but n no city in Wisconsin is going to be anything close to New York City. No, for good or ill. But if he's looking for dick, I'm just saying that he's would still not just in Wisconsin. That's <laughs> no, he's not. But I mean, not. the gay people will still be there. There is no. The gays are everywhere. 
but he won't know the scene. That's true. And he won't run into them. He won't run into people that he knows. He can just hide. Eh, he just has to go to the gym, apparently. And he can do push-ups in his room. And this is what Jeffrey is afraid of. He's seeing it play out right in front of him. He just had one of his best friends die of AIDS, and his other friend is utterly heartbroken over it. So how does a writer of a screenplay or the stage play this was based on get Jeffrey from seeing and being this to being a Jeffrey that's strong and brave enough to follow his heart? Well, since that's not going to happen in reality without years of therapy and antidepressants, the script calls out to the supernatural and has an angel, avatar, ghost, some manifestation or other of Darius show up, along with those things of his dead relatives, to give Jeffrey a pep talk that the script will then obligate him to be okay after. <laughs> Hate AIDS, Jeffrey. Not life. How? Just think of AIDS like... The guest that won't leave. The one we all hate. But you have to remember. What? Hey, it's still our party. Boo! Boo! <laughs> Boo! <laughs> Why are you booing? He shouldn't be okay right now. <laughs> but dead Darius is saying it's okay. Dead people don't come back to give you pep talk. <laughs> they do it in movies, apparently. Side note, the ghost of Darius's grandma Rose is played by Alice Drummond. We last saw her in Tu Wong Fu, Thanks for Everything, Julie Noir, episode 147. Jeffrey arranges an intimate candlelit dinner for two, with Mother Teresa smoking a cigarette and playing piano. Mother Teresa was a monster! So he can pretend and beg forgiveness and eventually end up in a relationship with Stephen. The end. So what is your problem with Mother Teresa? This is not that podcast. I am not going to go down into that rabbit hole, but she was a fucking monster. <laughs> she had the funds to cure all kinds of problems for all kinds of people in India. What she did is provide buildings where they could just fucking die. <laughs> but she prayed before they died. Fuck, Doesn't no, that count for not? I'm not even going to yes. <laughs> uh, no, this is not. No, uh, don't even pretend, Joe. It's, I know you know better than that. <laughs> All right, back to the movie. Does it still work? I think it works better now than it did then. Oh, interesting. Okay. But I'm. this is another one that it's like, we really should have had a gay person on for this. <laughs> we are not qualified to make that determination. For this. But for what we can see, right? Like, number one, it's a comedy. It's not a political commentary piece. It's a comedy. As a comedy, it's fucking funny. So that, that hurdle is met. Huh? I'm not a fan of them using the word transsexual, but also that's what the word was then. Wait, then you're not a fan with them using the word transsexual? Or uh, transoperative, whatever. Preoperative, uh, like, like preoperative transsexual lesbian son. You know, like, ha ha ha, look at all these different adjectives we can string together. But, like, during the scene with the fucking anchor that I cut out because I fucking didn't want to deal with it. Like, everybody uses the correct pronouns for this person like mm. unbidden without having to be corrected they just they're just that even the one that's the reporter not part of the the, the scene right? right so there's some really sweet moments in it that could have played better if they'd chosen words from 10 years after the thing came out <laughs> but it's 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 on the right side of things and it's asking a really important question for the time and it's not like you can't deal with covid right mm. what if you wanted to date during covid no it is not a 100 percent analogous thing to being gay with aids during a time when society was trying to kill you with it but it's still something of an analog to it, right? It's uh -huh. a question there of public health and what is our responsibility in it? So I think it's a it's a good movie that asks good questions and it's funny. Yeah, I think it still works. Well, we're both in agreement that it's funny. Uh, we're not in agreement that it still works. And I say that because I, I, just, I just found it to be a 90s sitcom, a very funny 90s sitcom. I'm surprised Jeffrey was never made into a, a series. These characters are not real people in any way, shape, or form. It doesn't have it, to it's be. A, it's a, it, it is, it's funnier than Birdcage, another movie I thought was really just a sitcom. Ultimately, yeah, I, I, I just found it to be a very well-written sitcom for the 90s. I, I, I don't think it has much to say for today. I don't think there's much you can relate to it. Uh, but then again, I'm not gay, so perhaps I know. I know this is a big film in gay cinema, and you're right. We don't have a gay person, on, so maybe I'm just maybe what I'm about to say is wildly offensive. But I 
don't think it has anything, any meaning in today's world. I think it's a, a, a good, funny sitcom from the 90s. You're like Golden Girls or, uh, I don't know, Night Court. So not even the question of, you know, virology and epidemiology and public health and our responsibility is as individuals to curb what might be our own pleasures so that we keep the public safe from things? I think you are stretching it. Okay. Quite frankly, I mean, yes, I know the premise is Jeffrey's afraid to have sex, but I I never felt there was always a bigger issue other than his sex life. I, I mean, look, I understand the film say other people are dying, blah, 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 but, and <laughs> I don't mean to blah, blah, blah that, but I guess I just didn't have any sort of emotional connection with it other than these characters. When someone we see dies, I get it, but for the broader world, I don't know. I didn't, I didn't feel Jeffrey was ever really in any danger. Hell, even when he has the, he's gay bashed, it turns into a, a musical number. I don't, this just Mother didn't Teresa. give me any sort of feeling of humanity to it. I found it to be a very funny sketches. Uh, I thought the uh, a, a very funny Patrick Stewart, a hilarious Nathan Lane. I, I would have enjoyed the movie being about him. <laughs> I'm surprised you didn't quote him. He's got some great lines in this I'm movie. I'm telling you people, go watch the fucking movie. It's worth <laughs> watching at least once. But it's just not something I think means a whole lot today, even with the undercurrent of, yes, we have d diseases today. Yeah, no kidding. Okay. Split so send your emails to Joe Dixon at don't... <laughs> does this still work? Send, no, just send all of your fucking criticisms to does this still, or dtswpod at gmail.com. I want to read your hate messages to Joe, too, so I can laugh. <laughs> all right, buddy, what's up next? Next week, we will be talking about the fifth Element from 1997, a movie all about love. The fifth element is all about love? Ultimately, kind of. I've never seen it. I know. No idea if you're joking or not. I'm not. <laughs> doesn't have Bruce Willis and, it uh, and um, Wesley Snipes in it? Not Wesley Snipes. Oh, okay. I must be thinking of another movie then. Uh, well, like I said, I didn't see it, so I have, I have no idea. So this is, our, what, our second, third uh, Bruce Willis film? Well, that should be interesting. Mm -hmm. All right. Anyway, so I guess that's it for this episode. I'm Joe Dixon. Thanks for listening. And I'm George Romacca. Thanks for listening indeed, because if a podcast drops and there's no one around to hear it, it's just another collection of ones and zeros that doesn't matter. Hi, my name is Dave, and I am sexually compulsive. Hi, Dave. I, uh, I love sex. Love it. Uh, maybe it's because I have a constant erection, I mean, like 24 hours a day, or because my penis is 14 inches long. Ooh. Hi, You've been listening to Does This Still Work? Produced by Joe Dixon and George Ramaka. The hosts can be reached via social media, email, or the contact page at dtswpod.com. Be good to yourself and others, because that still works. Mother Teresa is a monster! Wait, Mother Teresa was a monster! Speaking of Jeffrey, I just want to comment on that last clip you played. <laughs> Why did so many men of progressive groups in the past have such a hard time seeing female oppression? We often hear that Israel has a right to exist, but do countries actually have rights to exist? George, do you agree with the quote, in the US people are afraid of the government, in France the government is afraid of the people. What foreign languages would you want to master and why?